Today we're going to continue talking about this idea of fundamental group. So we'll talk about the fundamental group and then build up to something called the not group. And so let's recap our discussion of the fundamental group. When we had a space like S1, which we can think of as the unit circle, then we said any path into S1, any path that maps some 0, 1 into S1, we'll make it a loop, so we'll say that f of 0 and f of 1 both go to the same point, say, say this point right here, maybe that's the point 0, 1. So f1 and f0 both go to 0, 1. Um, we can also think of the line, the, the real line, as mapping down onto this space. So um, this is the, the map that takes some real number r and sends it to cosine of 2 pi r sine of 2 pi r. Then notice in particular, under this map, all of the integers get sent to 0, 1. So the points like 0, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2, those are the points that would map to 0, 1. So this sends integers n map down to 0, 1. Now we're ready to define a lift of a map. So given any map f, any, any loop, we can define the lift of f, f tilde, such that what? Well, we want to make sure that it maps up to something that maps down to f. So we want this nice commutivity that, that r composed with f tilde should give you f. And then we should specify that we want f tilde to begin at 0. We want f tilde of 0 to begin at 0. And then that uniquely defines a lift. So if you have some loop down here, for instance, you can imagine the loop that travels around twice in the counterclockwise direction. What does the lift of it look like? Well, the lift would begin at zero and it would travel to two. And last time we saw that since any lift has to end at some natural number up here, um, every lift of a path ends at some natural number. That gave us a correspondence between paths and the natural numbers up to homotopy. You may have some other guy that uh, ends at 2, and maybe, maybe he like overshoots 2 a little bit, then comes back. That would be going around twice, overshooting, and then coming back. But that's homotopic. You can homotope him to just going from 0 to 2. So we got a, a nice correspondence telling us that pi 1 of the circle with some base point, any base point, I'm not going to indicate it, but with some fixed base point, comes out to be isomorphic to the integers. There's one path in here up to homotopy for each integer. Okay. A very similar argument, I'm just going to run quickly. Yeah, let's, let's run it quickly. I'll do it over here. Um, it's, it's not related to what we're talking about today, but it, it's nice to see. I asked you last time to think about what is the fundamental group of the torus. And so let's see if we can think about this. So how do you think about what a torus is? I claim the correct way to think about a torus is you take a sheet of paper and you glue the ends together. Well, that gives you now a cylinder. And then what you do is you take the other ends and you glue those together. And if you glue those together, it'll make a torus. Right? So this, a torus, is secretly just a sheet of paper where you glue the ends together 
and that gives you a cylinder, and then you glue the top to the bottom, making a torus. So that's all that a torus is. Some, some shape where this side is glued up to this side, and this top is glued up to this bottom. So it's kind of like the game Pac-Man, where you have your little Pac-Man, and you're traveling around, and when you hit this wall, you come out from that wall. Or, or if you go to the top, you come out from the bottom. So that's what it'd be like to live on. You play Pac-Man on a torus. I believe that's how Pac-Man works, right? If you go out left, you come out, what was that? Asteroids as well. Asteroids? Okay. So lots of video games are played on toruses. So very nice. So now we might wonder, okay, what, how can we think about a path mapping to the torus? So I have some map, and we're limited to loops. So I want f of 0, f of 1 to you know, have some the same endpoint, so x or whatever. So maybe x is some some point here, and you're like, well, what kind of loops do I have on this thing? And you might be like, well, there are some loops that are kind of dumb, kind of lame, loops like this, but those can just be homotoped down to just the constant loop. So that's not a very interesting loop. But then, what's a more interesting loop? One that can't be homotoped away. Yeah, yeah, so one way to do it is you might go around like this. That's kind of interesting. Or you might think, okay, you know, it doesn't seem like you can homotope that because it's kind of stuck on there. Or, or you could go around like this. It's kind of interesting. You're like, well, there's anything else I could do? And you're like, well, what if I kind of went like a combination of the two? Kind of around, and then, you know, I kind of keep going around as I go around, you know? That, that's kind of a cool combination of those. So you can have all kinds of loops, right? And so the query is, how do we think about these? Well, let's go back to our circle for an analogy. What a circle really is, is it's just an interval with the ends glued together. And we said in order to think about a circle, what we should do is think about this cover of the circle, this guy up here, which was like a bunch of little circles, a bunch of ends glued together, right? So if the cover of the circle, this is called the universal cover of the circle, if it's a bunch of little intervals glued together, what do you think the cover, the universal cover of the torus would be? Well, we want to be gluing these pieces together somehow. And what happens if you glue these pieces together? Here we glue the torus so that the end is identified with the beginning, right? One tail, like the tail with the head, and so from there we kind of went tail, head, tail, head, and we glue them together into a line. So here we want to do something similar. We're going to take this, but, but glue them together. So you have one, but then since this right identified the left, I'm going to glue it to another one. So the left of this one is glued to the right of that one. Kind of glue them together in this way. And if you keep doing this, what do you get? Yeah, you get a plane. You get, you get R2 up here. So it seems like there's some map from R2 down into the torus. It's like, well, what should that map be? Well, let me, let me specify that these are integers. So this would be like the point 0, 0. This would be like the point um, 0, 1, 0, 2, etc. I keep going. I go up 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, etc. So I'm, I'm mapping out R2. And what I want is I want somehow to like map this whole thing onto here. Just like how I mapped each of these segments onto my circle. And so what might that map look like? How could I map the whole thing onto here? Let's say we understand this to be the one that goes from 0, 0 up to 0, 1 up to 1, 0, up to 1, 1. So we'll say the torus is the collection of points um, x, y, such that your x is between 0 and 1, not including 1, because once you get to 1, you're back at 0. And your y is between 0 and 1, not including 1, because when you're at 1, you're back at 0. So if that's how I describe my torus, and you know, I have this guy glued to that guy, I understand the identification. What, how would I do my map? 
what's a way to send any point in R2 to a point that looks like this? Uh, sine and cosine could do it. Good. Just drop the just drop the integral part. So like if you had some point, I don't know, like 2.5 and 3.7, you'd want your map to just send that to the point 0 0.5, 0 0.7, right? So in general, you can define this map by saying the point x y up here in R2 gets set to x minus the floor function on x and y minus the floor function on y. Well, that's just giving you the largest integer and less than or equal to your, your number. So that's just erasing the, the integer part. OK, well, now let's think about what happens when we lift. I'm going to lift f to f tilde, such that f tilde composed of this map, I'll call this map Oh, what should I call it? What do I call it? I call it R over here? That's okay. Sure, we can call this map R. Composed with R comes out to be F. And I want to say, let's say it sends X, which is maybe the point zero, zero, up to zero, zero. So it sends the point zero, zero up to the point zero, zero. So notice the, the pre-image of x, if x is like the point zero, zero down here, the things that get mapped to x, well, if you looked at like f tilde inverse, things that get mapped to that base point of zero, zero, it would include any of these points up here, any m and n, where m and n are integers, right? You know, like, like let's think about what this guy looks like. So let me, let me draw a path down here and think about what happens upstairs. Let's say we begin here at some point x. That's like beginning here. One thing you could do is go around. So I'm traveling over. If you go around once, it's just moving you over to zero, one. What if instead I went around this way? Well, that's going to move you up. So it's moving you up. Or, if I did some combination of these things, I might go around as I'm going around. What is that doing? Well, that's going over and up at the same time, so it's moving me there. And, you know, what, what would happen, uh, what is, how would you represent the loop that, say, loops around three times? One two, three, and then goes around. Well, that's just saying that we're going up, one, two, three, and then over. And so a very similar argument to before, you can see that the loops down here up to homotopy correspond with the ordered pairs, mn up here. And so you get that the fundamental group of the torus comes out to just be something isomorphic to z cross z. That is the pair of, this is just the group where you have the pair of elements x, y, where x and y are both in z. And so it's a little bit more complicated of a group structure than it was for just s1. Two numbers describe each each uh, loop, one number telling you how many times you loop in one direction, the other number telling you how many times you loop around the other direction. Cool, are we comfortable with that? Well, let's look at a few more spaces. How about the space, here's one. Let's think about the space, um, well, we saw it before. Um, we saw that the fundamental group of like some Rn, do you remember what that was? Yeah, that's trivial. So I think I called it one last time. I'll call it zero. Whatever your notation is, this, this is the trivial group. The group with just one element. Uh, why does it have just one element? Because if you have any two paths, call them like P 
and uh, maybe we'll call it P of S and Q of S, then they're related by a homotopy. So all paths are homotopic to each other. And what that homotopy does, uh, well, it, it begins with one of them, like P of S at time zero, you're there. But when you get to time one, this has now disappeared and you're left entirely with Q of S. And that was our homotopy. I call that like FT of S. So this is the homotopy where it begins at time zero, you have P, but then at time one, you have Q. Um, so the important property in order to do this, you need to make sure that you can, uh, there's no holes, there's no gaps. You know, if you have P, some, some P of S, and then you have your Q, what this is going to do is it's just going to drag it in a linear fashion from one to the other. You know, each point is going to be dragged in a straight line to the corresponding point over here. Each point is going to be dragged, giving you, you know, just this, this nice way, this, 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 like this. And so you need your space to be something called convex, that given any two points you can connect it by a line and stay in inside your space in order to do this. You can't do this like on a circle, because you have empty space in the middle. But if you're in Rn, you don't have any holes in the middle to, to get caught up. So this works. Okay, so let's consider a few other ones. How about um, R2 minus a single point? So what would that be if you had R2 minus a single point? So that's going to be a plane, but someone just removed a point. Uh, yeah, a plane minus a point is like a what? Never mind. Forget about it. Okay. I think you think of some kind of spherical projection or something. Uh. So what kind of loops could you have in here? Would that be different from having a circle hole? Oh, very good. Very yeah, very similar to a circle, right? If I have a loop that avoids that point, then I can just homotope it down to the constant loop. So that's not very interesting. But I might instead have a loop that goes around here once. And now I can't homotope it to the constant loop. Because as you try and homotope it, you know, as you try and pull it down, it gets stuck. You know, I, can't, I can't go through that missing point. So I have at least two kinds of guys. Something that doesn't go over the, loop, uh, the point, and something that goes around the point once. Is there a third kind of element in there? Yeah, yeah, you might instead have something that goes around like a couple times around that point, and then comes back home. And so you can convince yourself that this is like Z, right? That, that this, you, you would expect that this would come out to be just like it was for the circle, that it would come out to be Z. Well, another way to see this is you could actually deform this space you can continuously deform the sphere minus a point onto the unit circle. So, so here's the map I'll define. Um, let me define f of t to um, be a map that what I wanted to do is I want to begin with it being a time zero. I want it to just be the identity. So I want F zero of a point to just be that point. But then I want to end up at time one with it having moved all those points onto the unit sphere, the, the unit circle, the S1. So, so that would be taking some point and dividing it by its magnitude. And if that's my goal, then what should my function be? Let's try and think about this. Um, you take some point at time zero, I want to divide it by one. 
So it's one times t plus the time zero divided by one. So I think that's one minus t plus at time one, I want it to be divided by this. So it's t times the square root of x squared plus y squared. Yeah, that should do the trick. At time zero, this vanishes, this vanishes, and I'm left with just the point x, y. At time one, I'm left with the point x, y divided by its magnitude. So what this f of t is doing is it's taking any point out here, x, y, and it's slowly moving at time zero, it's here, but then it's moving it onto the unit circle. So this is a way to move all of R2 minus, zero, uh, minus the point zero, zero onto the unit circle. Now, I, I need that omission of zero, zero, because I don't want to be divided by zero. This wouldn't be defined if you had a point at zero at the origin, because then it would blow up. The point zero, zero wouldn't know what it mapped to. So this is only working for um, R2 minus zero, zero. But notice this is a way of moving um, the space onto onto um, onto a smaller subspace. So this, this is a map that's called a deformation retraction. So a deformation retract or retraction um, is a family of maps, some family f of t from x onto a subspace of x, onto some subspace A. This is, this is where A is a subspace of x, such that a few conditions are met. First of all, you want to make sure it begins being the identity. So f of 0 is just the identity map, which I'll denote by a bold one. F of one, you want it to map onto A. So F of one takes all of X and puts it onto the subspace A. And the last condition you need to be a deformation retract is that every moment of time, the map restricted to A is the identity. That's saying it leaves A fixed. Notice at any moment of time, this leaves the point on the unit circle fixed. So for a point on the unit circle, you have that x squared plus y squared square rooted is 1, right? Hence, for these nice special points, you get that f t of x, y is just the point x, y divided by 1 minus t plus t times 1, so plus t, which is just x, y. So this mapping leaves the unit circle fixed, and it pushes everything else onto it. Points on the unit circle just stay fixed there, while all these other points move onto the unit circle. Yeah? What does the third one say again? That the map restricted to the subspace. So if you just look at what the map does to your subspace, your target subspace, it is the identity at all times, at, for all t. For all t from 0 to 1. Like here, everything on the unit circle stays fixed, whereas all the other space comes flying into the unit circle. OK. Why are we going through this? Because um, think about what's going on here. I have a way of squishing my whole space onto some subspace. And if I'm able to squish my whole space onto a subspace, then you can think about what goes on with paths. Right? Like, like what can you say about, so for this guy, here's our proposition. If there exist a deformation retraction from x to a, then, then how do the fundamental groups 
of x and a compare. Well, if two loops are, are homotopic out in x, you can just uh, retract those down and they'll still be um, homotopic on the fundamental, on the, on the target subspace. And so you should convince yourself that um, these guys are actually isotopic. And we kind of see that. Like this crazy red loop that went around out and around this point three times and came back would just map onto some loop that goes around the circle three times. So this is just a way of making precise, I think, what you already figured out intuitively, which is this space just behaves in the exact same way as the circle, so it should come out to have the same fundamental loop of z. But it's saying anything that behaves like a, anything that retracts onto a circle. So if you know if your space X was some space like, oh I don't know, maybe this space with a little region cut out from it. So it's this space right here. Some space like that. Then you should convince yourself, well, what would the fundamental group of that be? Yeah, you could just deform this onto like a circle like this, right? All of these points would come in there, all of those points would come on. It would deform onto the circle. So pi 1 of x would be the same thing as pi 1 of the circle, which is z. So these are like holes or boundaries? Or... Yeah, that's right. This is just removing a point as a hole, or this is removing some, some section. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's get to a, a more interesting example. Well, this was R2 minus a point. What if, how about I thought about R3 minus the origin? So now I'm in three space. So, you know, I'm like some, some cube, goes on forever, but I represent three space by like a cube. And I've just removed some point. You know, I'll just remove that point from the cube. Would that make it like a sphere? Good. So you're exactly right. You can deform that space onto a sphere surrounding that point, right? Exactly like this deformation right here. The point x, y, z would just map in this way onto the sphere. And so everything would map onto the unit sphere. And so you would have that pi 1, so, so, so let's write that out. So R3 of 0, 0, 0 uh, deforms onto the sphere, the two-dimensional sphere, S2. Oh, there's one last thing I didn't say, but, but maybe it was assumed. Um, as, tip, as usual, th this FT is continuous. So this, this, of course, has to be continuous in T. But you can continuously move points onto the sphere. You can imagine any point, some point starting off here at x, y, z, and over time you just move him to his corresponding um, point of unit magnitude. So he moves to the point x, y, z divided by the magnitude of x, so the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So we're saying that then the pi 1, hence the pi 1 of r3 minus a point comes out to be the same thing as the pi 1, the fundamental group of S2. And what is the fundamental group of the sphere? Isn't it just r2? Oh, that's right. There's a, there's a nice correspondence between the sphere and r2. So you can think whatever's going on on the sphere should be very similar to R2 because you have some kind of like stereographic projection where you can kind of project the sphere onto R2, so it's very similar to R2. So what should the fundamental group come out to be? Yeah, it should be trivial. You know, any, any loop you try and draw on the sphere, you can always pull into, you know, you can kind of pull him up 
then pull them to a single point, right? So you're going to use homotopy to a single point. There's no way to get caught on anything on the sphere. You can just pull it over to a single point. So everything is homotopic to the constant map on the sphere. So the pi 1 of the S2 is just the trivial group. It has only one element, the constant map. Everything is homotopic to the constant map. Happy with that? OK. One more example. So we're just going to do lots of examples today, but we're building up to something. What if we took R2 and subtracted a circle? Not R2, sorry, R3. So, so what do I mean by that? So here we have you know, some three-dimensional space still, you know, in three-dimensional space. This is, this is where we have to kind of stretch our thinking a little bit. But then we drilled out some circle. So the, the space is missing. It's like, you know, there's some bug that ate up the space time and it's gone. So, so we drilled out that circle. So that circle does not exist anymore inside of our space. Yeah, it's kind of tough to think about. What can you... Is there something you can deform that space onto? Well, everything away from, everything away from that circle, we can still, like all this outside stuff, we could still deform onto a sphere, right? But now we've got a problem because we have like, what's going to go on inside the sphere? Well, inside the sphere, you know, the points kind of away from the circle can be mapped easily to the outside, but you've got some funny stuff going inside. Well, inside it's like, it's not clear because it has to kind of go around, so, so how can you do it in a nice continuous way? And so the trick here is we're going to add not just this sphere, but a sphere with a line going through it to the back. And then convince yourself that there's a nice deformation of R3 minus S1 onto the sphere with a line going through it. So I claim that R3 minus S1, that's this guy, there's a nice deformation retract. To a sphere with a single line going through the middle. which you could deform. So you can continuously deform this. You know, may maybe instead of just being a line through the middle, that's kind of confusing. So I'm going to take these two endpoints of the line where it connects with the sphere, and I'm going to move them a little bit closer to, to, that, to that right point. And then I'm going to move it a little bit closer, even more so. So I take these two points, and I move them to a single point, and now I just have a loop inside the sphere. So this is kind of weird. You have a, you have a sphere, but inside of the sphere, you have a loop. You can zoom if you want. So, so you have a loop inside of the sphere. Did you kind of follow that series of steps? No. This whole space, the, the complement of the circle can be mapped onto here, um, a sphere with a circle going through like some diameter that maps onto a circle with a loop. And then my question is, what is the fundamental group of this? It's just like a circle. Yeah, that's right. Um, because any, any thing, any map, any path, any loop you put on, here on the outside part, can still be home to the trivial map. The only interesting thing that might happen with your loop is maybe your loop comes down and loops around here some number of times before re-emerging out there. And so all that matters is how many times it loops around that circle. The sphere is not contributing anything to it. And so the, the fundamental group 
of, I guess we can write it right here, the fundamental group of R3 minus the circle is very similar to its um, deformation retracts onto just a sphere, this is called wedged a circle, but that has the same um, fundamental group as just the circle, whose fundamental group is Z. Okay, let me give us one other way that you might convince yourself that the fundamental group of this is Z. And this is now the key idea I want us to get into. So this was the insight of Vertinger. And so Vertinger tells us the way to think about it is something like this. You have your circle that you removed, but now just think like, you know, any, you fix some base point, so I'll fix some base point. This is my, you know, some, some base point. So I have my loops all centered, um, all beginning any of that base point. And then I can think, okay, well, you know, if I have any loop that's going on out here and doing any foolishness, that's just equivalent to the trivial loop. So these are all trivial. It's just homotopy to the trivial loop. The only interesting thing that happens is when you loop loops around the circle, right? And in addition to looping around it once, you might have some loop that comes and loops around it a couple times. Maybe several times before coming back down. And so all you have to do is keep track of, you know, what's going on. It's just, well, things can loop around here, so if we think of this, this yellow loop right here as this guy, if I think of this loop, maybe I should give it a new color to differentiate it from this one. Think of this reddish yellow loop now as, call it the loop X, then every other loop is just some combination of X's. Well, it could be like this guy, which is like zero X's, but all these other ones like this one, what did he do? He just did an X. And then another x move and another x, so, so this loop's just like x to the fourth, right? Or, you know, if you're keeping track of the direction, let's say this one was to go in and loop like that, uh, I guess the, we're assuming the loop's over, then you could also like loop the opposite direction, which would be an x inverse move. But you get the fundamental group for R3 minus the circle to be just some group that's generated by X. So, so this is called, this is the group generated by X. So that's just called a free group because there's no constraints on it. It's just everything you can get by X. So, so this is the group of elements x, x squared, x cubed, so forth. Uh, x to the zero, there's like one. That's the, those are your trivial loops. That's like this guy right here. This is x to the zero, which is one. x inverse, that's looping the opposite direction. x to the minus two, that's looping the opposite direction twice. So that's what your group is. This is just a copy of z. That's just a copy of z. But here I'm thinking of like my one as being x. You know, z is like one, two, three, four, five, or, or I guess like, uh, yeah, my one, the unit that builds up z is, is x. So x is called the generator of this group. Savvy? Okay. So if we can do it with the circle, ah, what is the circle? The circle is secretly just an unknot. So what we want to do now is consider what if it wasn't a circle, 
but it was knotted up in some way. So what if we begin with some knot, some knot k, for instance, the trefoil. And you know, for what I'm about to do, we should probably draw this quite large. Some not K, like the trefoil. And what we want to be able to think about is what is the fundamental group of, let me write it here, what's the fundamental group of R3 minus the knot? So we just drill out the knot from our space. Or maybe a little thickened up version of the knot, you drill out. So that's what we want to figure out. And so we're going to proceed exactly like before with the unknot. Um, to aid us, I'm going to give some orientation to this guy so we can keep track of which way we're looping around it. So I orient my knot. I have some base point. And you might think, okay, what can happen to my base point? Well, I have three different arcs to this knot. And from my base point, I can go around and get looped to any one of them. You know, I could go around and loop up with that arc right there. And so let me, let me give an orientation to, to my uh, arc, that my, my loop that agrees with this orientation. Let me get right-handed. So I'm going to orient it like this. We'll call that maybe X. Or I could go around and I could loop up with this other arc of the knot. So I'll call this arc Y. So, so this, is, this is the loop Y looping around the second arc of the knot. Or I could go and connect with this third guy, so he needs to go like this. I'll call that Z. And he's some loop with this kind of orientation. So then what do I have? Well, my group is any, it's going to be generated by these guys x, y, and z. Because any loop I might have will be some combination of these guys. You know, like you might imagine some loop that goes and loops around that arc, and then kind of, you know, goes over so, so what might he do next? Then he might go over here and loop around this arc and then come back and you're like, well, what? Let's keep track of his orientation. What was that blue loop? Well, he just did an X loop and then a Z loop and he came back. So that's just the loop X, Z. Or you could have some more complicated combination of these guys. So everything is some combination of X, Y, and Z. And again, you still have trivial loops, like this uh, red one that just doesn't interact with the knot, but then you can just be homotope to zero, so that's just like the, uh, the trivial element in the group. So the group has x, y, and z. But then there's one more thing to notice. Let's zoom in to this crossing right here. And when I zoom into that crossing, so that looks like This, I can notice a few things. Notice I have Z going under him right there. Over here, I'd have a, an X. I'd have X going under him. On this strand, I'd have a, a Y going under him, pointing in this direction. And this last strand, I also have an X, an X that goes like, like, oh, X goes this direction. There we go. But I want you to notice something. If I combine my Z and my X, combine my Z loop with my X loop, 
That's the same as looping around him, but then also looping around him, which would just be a single loop over the center like that. But that's the same because I loop over him and I loop over him. When I combine those, it gives me a loop over both of them, so zx. But that's the same as doing, well, this is x. That's the same as if I had first done x and then y. So here, this is a relationship between x, y, and z. I have that z times x is x times y. The crossing has given me a relationship between my generators. And if I go and I look at my next crossing, I can get another relationship between them. Can you, can you spot it? Let's see if we can figure it out. So my z looks like this. This is z, um, and this is z. Here I have, this is y, and y is going this way. I'm making sure it's always right-handed, so that would be right-handed. And then this guy is what, what, which, uh, arc, which uh, loop crosses over him? X. So I have an X here, and to make it right-handed, it needs to go this way. An X. So what's my relationship? Well, yeah, doing Z then X, should be the same as doing y then z. Um, I'm a little bit suspicious. And you messed up on the y. Um, on the first one you think I messed up? No, the, no, the new one, one, the y should be going over. Oh, yes. Yes, that's going the wrong direction, isn't it? Uh, no, that's going the right direction. But, but it crosses. Oh, this one's going the wrong direction. Uh, no, that's going in the right direction. Does it matter that the y is, you, you have a draw of the y going under, but not, but it goes over. Yeah, no, I, I have the y coming under like this, and if you move that around, it looks like that. So that's right. Oh, okay. uh, let me check the first one really fast. Z is correct. Y is correct. X is correct. So that gives me that ZX is XY. Well, I guess these are, that's fine. So they both look good. So let's do one more from the last guy. One more from the last guy. His relationship would tell us, here I have my Y. Here I have my Z. Here I have a Z. Here I have, um, nope, that's not Z, that's X now. Here I have Y again. So I'd have that X, Y is Y, Z. X, Y is Y, Z. There we go. Yeah, so my knot group for the trefoil, this is called the knot group. So for the trefoil, when k is the trefoil, it came out to be generated by x, y, and z with the relations zx is xy, zx is yz, and xy is yz. Now, what is xz? Well, you could try to deduce it from these relations, new relations. But these are like the, all the relations you need. Everything else can be deduced from those. So that's called a presentation for the group, a way of listing the generators and relations. So I'm just going to put down my, my group presentation. So it's x, y, z with the relations xz, zx is xy, zx is yz, 
and x, y is y, z. Isn't that inferred from the other two? Good. So, so let's, um, let's get that in a second. These are called my generators. These are called my relations. And you're allowed, so you can add and remove um, generators if they are defined in terms of the other generators. And like you said, our relators is the same story. So not just generators, but also relators. So generators or relators, or relations, I should say. Relations, relations. So notice this last relationship is not necessary because it follows immediately from the first two. So you can just strike it. You can just exclude it. You don't need to list that. It's redundant information. Uh, is there anything else that's redundant? Uh, yeah, you could compress it all like that. I like to list it like this. We could compress it all like that. Um, notice from this first one, Z is the same as, I can move my x over by putting its inverse on the right as x, y, x inverse. So z is defined in terms of x and y. So I don't need to talk about z, because z is redundant. He's just defined by x and y. So z, so since z is just a relationship between x and y, I can cut out the z leaving me with just x and y. So I, I strike that z. Now, I don't need um, this relationship anymore because I don't, I don't have any z's to talk about. You know, I don't need this relationship because all this relationship's saying is that z is x, y, x inverse, but I'm not even talking about z, so I don't need to put that there. How about the second relationship? Well, I should still preserve the relationship but I don't want to use the letter Z. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace that Z in that relationship with what Z is. It's X, Y, X inverse. So instead of being, X, instead of being Z, X equals Y, Z, that becomes, well, Z is X, Y, X inverse times X equals Y times X, Y, X inverse. So I'm just getting Z, rid of my Z's in the story. And now my X inverse and my X cancel. So I'm left with a single relationship. X, Y is Y, X, Y, X inverse. So, so this group is the same as this group which is the same as saying, well, I can multiply that x on the right. I think it would look a little bit nicer. It's the group x to y generated by x, y with the relationship x, y, x is y, x, y. Is that believable? Yeah, follow that? Okay, so I was going to do an example with the figure eight knot, but I think you can do it. So, should I get started for you? Yes. Or, yeah? I don't want to. <laughs> so, I think you can do it. I mean, you can, it's not bad, right? So you can do this for any knots. So, so this works for any knot. So, so, this works for any knot. So for instance, if my knot K is the figure eight knot, 
Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll say a few words to get you started, and maybe um, you can work out the details. I'll attach a problem set so you can work out the details. But if this is some, some knot, let me give it some orientation. You know, it's like, how, how do you do this? Well, for each arc, we need to include some, some generator. So for this arc, you can include some, some x, and I guess it needs to be pointed out this way, some x generator, right? Which is the same as saying that up here is this x generator. And then like for this next arc, you might call it some y generator. So he has some like y, y generator. Oh, this is still an x generator like right here. Um, and then you come like down here, this is still a y generator. And right here, it's still a Y generator. And then when you get over here to this arc, it needs some new generator. So let me call it, or what should I call it? Uh, Z. And he comes over here, and you have Z. And you come up over here, and you have Z. And you now have this last guy. And so we should call it, yeah, I guess it's not next in the alphabet, we can call it W. So you can have your W generator. And when he comes down here, he's still W, W, um, W looks, something like that. And then, so then you just list it. You say that the knot group for R3, so the fundamental group of R3 minus minus the um, k. Sometimes we just write this as pi 1 of k, but that's kind of silly because it's like k is just a circle, so that's really just z, but what I really mean by this is, is the fundamental group of r3 minus k. That comes out to be the guy generated by, going to need plenty of space, generated by x, y, z, w with the relationships and then for each crossing, you just go and you figure out what the relationship is. So here it's like, well, wy is the same thing as yx. And then you go to the next crossing. It's like, what's going on there? Well, yw is the same thing as wz. yw, same thing as wz. And then you go to the next crossing. You're like, what's going on there? And you're like, well, xz is the same thing as, oh, did I draw something backwards? As wx, that's right. And then for the last crossing, you have that zx is the same thing as y, z. And then your job is to try and go through and simplify your And it's not too bad because you can be like, well, well, how can we simplify our lives? Well, look, y is secretly just w, z, w inverse, right? And so since that's what y is, throw out your y and throw out that generator. And you can also say like, oh, I don't know, like this guy can tell you that your W is just X, Z, X inverse. So you can throw out your W and throw out that guy. But then you need to rewrite these generators using only X and Z. So you rewrite this using only X and Z. So you replace your W with this guy and your uh, Y with this guy. And so you, you want to go, oh. Okay, so there's a little bit of work to rewrite these then only using W and Z. So I'll, I'll leave that to you. Okay, but what I want to talk about in the final couple of minutes are two last examples, they'll be quick, but they allow us to prove some really fantastic things.
Yes, like really profound things, like magic. So I'm going to do two more examples that will allow me to do some magic tricks for you. Okay, so here's the first one. Uh, instead, of, instead of doing knots, I can do a link. So let me do the link with two components. And this, so this is a trivial link with two components. Then what is the pi 1 of the complement of L? And you're like, well, same game as always. You have some base point. You have some guy that goes around here, some x. You have some guy that goes around there, some z. And so the group is just the guy gen Oh, yeah, let's call it y. Probably makes more sense than z. So just the group generated by x and y. And what are your relationships? What are your relations between x and y? There are no relations. Yeah, there are no relations. So that's it. So this is called the free group. The free group, um, we could say uh, of rank two. It's with two generators. So we indicate that by saying the rank of the group is two. But it's a free group. And, and you should notice things like, like in this free group, example, in this free group, xy is not the same thing as yx. Because I don't have any relationship like that that came out of it. And if you look at it, you can convince yourself. So let me give these some orientation. So I'll orient this um, like this. I'll orient this. That's fine. That's fine. So he's going like this. He's going like this. OK. So like, what does x, y look like? Well, I do an x, and then I do a y. So x, y is like I do an x, and then I loop around y. So this is x, y. And what does, um, y, x look like? Well, I go around, and I loop around a y, and then I go around, and I loop around x. And so what you should do is convince yourself that these are fundamentally different things. And so one way to do that is you could get two loops, <laughs> two unconnected loops, and then like, you know, take a piece of string and go through the one with an x and a y and have your piece of string and go through the one with a y and an x and convince yourself that they're not, not equivalent. OK. What if, however, I have something that looks like this? Now I'll still have same orientations. So these are looped, but they connect once. This is called the half link. Now I still have an x, and I still have some y. So I still have x and y. But what relationship do I have? Well, like you look really close, like right here, I have like a relationship at this crossing, right? Like here I have my y and y, and here's my x, and here's my x. What's the relationship I get? x, y is the same thing as y, x. So the fundamental group of the complement of this link is still generated by x, y, but now with the relationship that x, y equals y, x. And, and you could check at this other um, crossing, it's the exact same relationship. You just have x, x, y, y, so you get x, y is y, x. OK, so this, this is like before, where you have a free group, but now the elements commute. The x and y is the same thing as y and x. So this is a free abelian group. Abelian just means it's commutative. This is called a free abelian group of rank 2. 
And so in this group, for instance, quick example, the word, if I was to look up the word like x, y squared, x inverse, y cubed, a word like this, you can just simplify by moving all the x's next to each other because the x and y's commute. So it's x, x inverse, y squared, y cubed. And it would simplify to just, well, I guess the x's would cancel, and you'd be left with just y to the fifth. So your x and y order should commute here. Why is this cool? Two magic tricks. Two magic tricks you can do now. The first is actually, you might think it's an anti-magic trick. So maybe you've been to some magic show where someone has some rings. Mm -hmm. And they've done something where they have these rings and, and they pulled on them and suddenly, you know, without breaking it open, somehow they pulled on them and they came apart. Have you seen tricks like this? Well, we've just shown that that's not possible. Why? Because when they're apart, the fundamental group is a free group that's not abelian. This, this is not abelian. This is, this is not abelian. Boss, are you saying magic isn't real? That's what we've just proven. No. Here we go. But, but here, when they're together, the fundamental group of the complement is abelian. And so next time you see a magician try to do this, you can raise your hand and you can say, wait a second, you started out with something whose fundamental group of the complement was abelian. And then when you pulled it apart, somehow it became not abelian. I know you cheated. So that's the first reason that this is very good. But the second is it actually enables you to do a better magic trick. And let me show you the magic trick. Here, the word x, let's think about the word x, y, x inverse, y inverse. What does that word look like? We can draw it. We can draw this word. I'm going to draw it up here. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to need to go through with an x, and then I come over here. And I need to, to go through him with a y. And then I need to go through here with an x inverse. So instead of crossing over, I'm crossing under this time. And then I'm going to come over here to a y inverse. So instead of crossing uh, under, I'm crossing over. And then I'm going to come over and I should, you know, I should close this up. So I guess I can attach it. I can attach it right here. You see that strand right there? So, so this, this is the word. This, this little strand right here represents the word x, y, x inverse, y inverse. Tracking with me? Okay. Since it's free and it's not abelian, x and y do not commute. So this is not equivalent to the trivial word. What does that mean? That means I can't pull the strand free from these guys. I can't pull it out here because then it would be trivial, right? So, volunteer. Come on, quick, someone. Yeah, sir. You can hold the two circles. Hold this one and you both hands. So you hold them both. And now, let me create the word X y x inverse y inverse so so my rule for x is i'm going to go over and in for my x and then to get y i need to go over and in for the y now for x inverse i'm going in and come out so i'm coming out instead of going in and and for my y inverse instead of going in since it's y inverse i come out i come out and i connect it up so i've just made the word x y x inverse y inverse thank you yes sir now now look what I made. It's like, I don't know what that is. Let me show you what this is. You can rearrange it. You can make it look like this. It's like, look, they're stuck together. I can't get the white guy off. I can't get him off. 
But this is a very special ring. You may have heard of it before. It's called the Borimian rings. Because if you think about these rings, they're linked together. We just proved the link together because you can't pull them free. They're linked together, although no two of them are linked together. Like, you know, the yellow and the orange, I can pull away from each other. The yellow and the orange, I can pull it away from each other. It's just this white guy keeps them stuck together, but otherwise I could pull them away from each other, you know? If it wasn't for the white guy, they, they would go away from each other, not linked. Or like the white guy and the orange guy, I could pull them away. The orange guy and the white guy are not linked. So I could pull the orange guy free from the white guy. They're, they're, they're not linked to each other. But the yellow guy's holding them together. So no two of them are linked, but they're all stuck together. That's what we just proved. So that's one way of visualizing them. Um, another way of visualizing them is, you know, I have this, this orange guy, and I make sure that my white one is always on top of it. And then I have some like yellow guy that, that goes like something like this. And he needs to be always under him, but over, over him. So there you have it. And if you think about these links, I'll probably include a nice image of them. If you think about these links, no two of them are linked. Like white and orange, they're not linked. White's always on top of orange, so they're not linked. Or like yellow and white. Uh, white is, oh, oh, no, something went wrong. Yellow should go on top of white. Yellow should be going on top of, there we go. White is always under yellow, so they're not linked. So, so these guys, no two of them are linked, but they're stuck together, and that's what we just proved. So we proved that you can't detach the Borimian rings. It's incredible. It has a nice threefold symmetry. Nice threefold symmetry here. It kind of looks like the trefoil in the middle of it. So, very nice. Okay. You think that's magical. You haven't seen anything yet. So we have the Borimian rings. And these are quite incredible because no two of them are looped, but the three as a system are looped. The three as a system are looped. But, but notice what happens. So here we have this, this white guy that's playing the role of x, y, x inverse, y inverse. And he, he's not equivalent to the trivial one in this system. But we claim that if we were to change to this setting over here, then x, y, x inverse, y inverse would be trivial. Because this is the free abelian group. And the only difference is here, our two loops of the link were not linked. Here they are linked once. And so, if we leave the white guy exactly how he is, but we just loop together the yellow and the orange, so I'm just going to loop together the yellow and the orange, just by doing that one move, we should be able to free the white loop. And sure enough, we can free the white loop. So that's the difference between being Abelian and non-abelian. Okay, we'll stop there. <laughs>